Thank you, Chair. Good morning, members. Um, before I call the Sudarian, I would just like to remind you all to keep your microphones on mute this morning. If you have a question that you wish to ask in terms of any of the applications, please use the hands up function. Um, in terms of the Sudarian this morning, if you could unmute your, phone, unmute your microphone and confirm your attendance when your name is called, please. We have apology this morning from Councillor Roberts. Councillor Jenkins. I'm sorry, I thought you were going to my apologies. Sorry. Yes, I'm here. Councillor Friel. Yes, Lynn, thank you. I'm here. We also have an apology this morning from Councillor McFadgen. Councillor, Mac Councillor Mackay. I am here, Lynn. Thank you, present. Councillor Cook. Yes, here, Lynn. Councillor Campbell. Yeah, here, thanks. Councillor Maitland. Here, thanks, Lynn. Councillor Mayor. Here. Councillor McGee. Here. Councillor Crawford. Here. Councillor Bell. Here, Lynn. Councillor Filson. Present. In terms of officers attending committee this morning, members, we have David McDowell. Fiona Finlay, Craig Young, Kerr Chalmers, David Wilson and Marion Ferguson. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thanks, Lynn. So uh, after that, we now have a call for the exclusion of press and public. Uh, is that OK with everyone? Thank you. I'm not hearing any sense, so thank you. Well, and Chair, sorry, Chair. I've tried to come in. Uh, I think we're only excluding the, the public, not the press, if I'm correct, using the agenda. Oh, you are correct. You are correct, Tom. Sorry, exclusion of public. My mistake. Thank you very much. Declaration of interest. Anyone has uh, an interest to declare? No? OK, thank you. In which case, we'll move on to item three in the agenda, which is the Stenlow uh, Community Wind Farm. Uh, and this item has been withdrawn this morning uh, in the light of communications that have come in recently. Uh, we've decided to withdraw this item and hopefully it's going to be brought together uh, back to the planning committee in a couple of weeks' time once we have had a chance to properly uh, look at the, the uh, information that's just recently come in. So we'll now move on to item four in the agenda, which is planning application number 190582PP. It's a residential development with associated groundworks, landscaping and services at Street of Glasgow Road and Western Road Shopping Centre, Glasgow Road, Kilmarnock, East Ayrshire by AS Homes. And it's pages 51 to 109 in your papers. Fiona, are you taking us through this? Thank you. Over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Chair, and good morning, everybody. The application before you is by AS Homes, and as Chair has advised, it is for a residential development and associated works that land from Glasgow, off Glasgow Road in Kilmarnock. The site lies within the Kilmarnock settlement boundary, and the proposal is for 45 houses. Whilst the application report clarify the developer's latterly stated intention that these are homes for social rent, this has been by email only and without clarification of the end user of a registered social landlord, and as such, the application is also assessed as a generic residential development. Paragraph 9 um, starts in your papers to illustrate a more detailed explanation of the proposal, but in brief, the application is for 45 units from a single access point on Glasgow Road with open space provided in both public and private space with a mix of detached, terraced and cottage flats, all two storeys in height. If you can bear with me, I'll just head into share screen mode and hopefully be able to show you some details. Can everybody see that? OK. Sorry, I'm just trying to get into the slideshow. Sorry, just bear with me, members. There we go. 
Okay, that should be me now. So just let me skip. Should be the full screen now, members, so it should be a bit more clarity for you. Okay, so here we have the application site um, in relation to the sort of settlement of Kilmarnock. Here you have Western Road and here you have Glasgow Road and this is the M77. This road takes you up towards South Craigs, which you can see in here, and towards the, um, the interchange with the M77. You'll see just in here, members, the roundabout at the top of Western Road and Glasgow Road, where you've got this, the local shopping centre with Tesco, um, BP filling station and some of the individual retail units here. So that's the application site there. Here's the, the applicant's layout of the site. You'll see that there is an access point here that takes you through the site. You'll see the mix of properties that we have here. We have some semi-detached, we have a mix of terrace, and we have some cottage flats at the back here with parking courts, parking areas, and you'll see private garden ground. And you'll also see some amenity, open space, and recreational and open space throughout the site. You'll see the pedestrian links that the applicant has intimated here, here, and here. And obviously you have the main access here as well. Um, we always put this plan up for you members, so it's just to show you that this is white land, not particularly zoned for any particular use. And you'll see the black line is the settlement boundary of Kilmarnock, see that it's located within the settlement boundary of Kilmarnock. OK, we have moving on just to some house type plans for you members, which I'll flick through. Moving on to photos that the, uh, the case officer has taken of the site. This is standing from the um, back of the site looking towards Glasgow Road. You'll see the houses at DeWaldon Drive, which are the um, site of the former Ravalan Creamery. You'll see the individual property there in Glasgow Road. Um, this is the photograph shows you towards Burns Crescent, which is the old former Burns Nurseries. Um, you'll see just sort of the general paths and desire lines through the site. Um, Again, just another view looking um, sort of north towards um, Burns, Burns Crescent, which is the development by Redrow Homes. Again, just across the site. This is looking back to the site towards Cumbria and Heston Place. And then obviously you have sort of Kingsford Place and South Craigs over here. Again, that's looking um, back towards Cumbria and Heston Place. This is the existing access that's there uh, toward, um, onto Cumbria, um, which um, residents seem to use to get in access into the um, retail centre. Uh, this is moving back towards Heston Place, etc. further back. Just a, more desire lines in the path that's coming from Cumbria into the, um, I think it's into here, into the, the retail park, which is the retail park, sorry, the retail shopping centre. Again, just showing you views across the site towards Glasgow Road. Uh, this is the um, part of the site where you, this footpaths over that take you into towards Kingsford Place, which is at South Craigs. Back towards Glasgow Road from the very back of the site. Uh, sorry, just to go back to that one, members, that's the retail park, retail, um, keep calling it retail park, but it's actually the neighbourhood centre, um, and you'll see there. Uh, this is um, Heston Place here, members. Uh, this is Glasgow Road um, at the access, and you'll see the bus shelter that's referred to in your report for relocation, should planning permission be granted, obviously. Um, this is Glasgow Road, just looking back towards the roundabout and the, the neighbourhood centre there. And that's the houses in Devolden Drive that I was referring to earlier. 
Retail Park again, members. Okay, I will just take you back very quickly. Sorry, I'm flicking back there. I just wanted to clarify something for you on the location plan. So I'm going to very quickly flick back. Um, this is, sorry, one second. Yep, I'll use this one. Uh, this is Kingsford Place up here. This is Heston Place. This is Cumbry Drive area. And this is Glasgow Road here. And you can just see, um, this is the access I was telling you about, showing you in the photographs members that take, people have been using to get into the retail park here. And you can see the desire lines. And I showed you a picture to saying that led you into South Craze. And that's just at this point here. So that was just a little bit of extra clarification for you. OK, so I'm going to stop sharing now and go back to the presentation. Um, turning back to the report to summarise the consultation process. ARA in traffic terms, there's no objections to the application as noted in paragraph 16. SEPA and ARA flooding have been able to confirm after some extended back and forth discussions with the applicant's agent that they have no objections. Scottish Water and the Coal Authority do not object, nor do East Ayrshire Leisure and Environmental Health Service for general environmental high I, for both general environmental health advice and in terms of contaminated land. Mm -hmm. Housing comments are also noted in your report. The public representation process has, has received um, nine letters of objection, one petition of 39 signatures, and there have been no letters of support. Summary objections are in relation to how, social housing, pedestrian links, into structural integrity, vermin, greenfield and flooding, water courses, bus stop relocation, traffic matters, private open space, inaccurate documents, boundaries and maintenance, which are obviously a legal matter members, concern regarding notification periods being inaccurate, planning portal issues such as neighbour notification, crime, value of property, antisocial behaviour and type of tenants, which you'll be aware are not material planning considerations. Town and Country Planning Scotland Act 97 as amended requires that applications are determined in accordance with the development plan unless material considerations indicate otherwise. For the purposes of this application, the relevant policies in the development plan are contained within the East Ayrshire Local Development Plan from 2017. We've put most weight in the termination of application against Res 1, which encourages and supports residential development within settlement boundaries. The application site is located within the Kilmarnock settlement boundary and the principle of development draws support from Res 1. In this instance, the policies on the East Ayrshire Local Development Plan are generally complied with as noted in your report. There are material considerations relevant to the application. It's considered on balance, but these are largely supportive of the application on the whole. Proposed development can be satisfactorily accommodated within the application site and the development will afford a housing development in appropriate location with a high standard of design, building on the already successful development in this area of Kilmarnock. The development will foster a sense of community without adversely affecting the amenity of neighbouring properties. Whilst the applicant advises that the development is for affordable housing in its entirety, having amended the terms of the application, the application hasn't been submitted with a registered social landlord as applicant, and there's no further details relative to this provision. We've therefore assessed the application on the basis of the generic residential development in policy terms, and that's why 25% of the homes need to be affordable in terms of the local development plan. No dispensation in policy terms has been provided by the app provided to the applicant relative to proposals that would require a site-wide restriction of tenure, and to do so, I consider would be ultra varies and beyond our powers. The de residential development proposal can be accommodated on site and approval is warranted with the legal development provision as outlined in paragraph 94 of this report on page 95, and we therefore recommend that subject to conditions and the conclusion of a legal agreement that the application be determined, be approved, um, with the application not being determined, the, the decision notice not being released until the um, legal agreement has been concluded. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Fiona. So, members, uh, over to you. Is there any questions for officers at this stage? Uh, as is our usual pattern, I suggest that at this stage, you know, we're not moving to determination. This is just questions for clarification. If there's anything that you would like clarified, and I see one hand up, but I can't see who it is from here. Uh, 
Hey, Councillor Filson, would you like to go ahead, please? Thanks. Thanks, Chair. Uh, just a wee bit of information from Fiona, if you can, uh, through their photographs and their plan. The double white house, I see it's got the uh, bifolds in the upstairs level. Could you show me on the plan just where that double white house is, if you know the one I'm talking about, Fiona? Yes, absolutely. I'll show you if you could give me a second to go back into the shared tree. It is in here. Can you see where I'm? I'm, I'm kind of moving the mouse. Yeah, not really. No. Got a wee thing up on um, the let me just see if I can show you in a different map. Yeah, I can't get that to move. Um, for some reason, really, the presentation won't relocate. Um, actually, if I just, I'll, I can't get the presentation to work, I'm afraid, on the share tray. So if you can just give me a minute. Um, I'll just go to the plan at the very back of your report. So if you just give me a sec and I'll be able to guide you to it verbally, I'm afraid. Um, if you go to page 109. Sorry, I can't get the share tree to work. If you go to page 109, that's the that's the um, ordnance survey plan, and you can see the shading of the application site. Yes. Okay. See, can you see within the application site the word South Craig's Holding? Yes. And see to the very north of that, you can see oh, about yes. two buildings. It's in there. Uh huh. Okay. So it's just next to the Glasgow Road there, basically. Yes, it is. It's accessed yeah. from Glasgow Road. It was an old house that I think was in a pretty bad condition for many years and the gentleman um, rehabilitated it and extended it. So it's a single property in its own ground and, and that, it's accessed from Glasgow Road. That look over the first two houses on the right as you enter the site, is that correct? Just give me one second. It's to, if you look at the plan in 108, it's just to the very north of the area of recreational space at 7, 709 right. Skew M. It's not actually looking into the houses, it's looking... No. In, right, OK, if you want to answer that, clarifies that. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Cook. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Right, just going back to, to the slides again, the one uh, showing the entrance into Heston Place or the link, there seems to be quite a difference in level of ground there. A large retaining wall. I'm just wondering, in terms of, of uh, that wall, if there's any proposal, and I don't see it in the actual uh, recommendations, that, that there's a design put in for stabilising that retaining wall uh, before we actually uh, start to build, or what the, what the proposal is in relation to the existing ground level, whether that's going to be brought up to match the, the ground level in place. Thank you. Apologies for the delay that I was just looking through the report. Um, if there is a condition about general boundary treatment um, to give us details of it, of general boundary treatment, we do have in, um, floor levels already. There is no harm um, in perhaps amending the conditions to clarify that. Um, at the moment, the applicant has advised us that it's a mutual boundary wall. I believe there may well be homeowners saying obviously different to that, as you've seen in the report. Um, but certainly we've gone in the information that the applicant has given us that it's a mutual wall. That becomes a legal matter in terms of any work to that wall. Um, given the, the levels differences, I did raise this with the, ca the case officer who's advised that it may well need to be ramped, etc., to give that access. Um, but certainly we could add in a condition or add in a sort of amend 26, we perhaps have a 26 sort of B, 26A and 26B to clarify the levels and how that link is going to be formed as part of the boundary treatment condition, yes, if you chose to plant to grant consent, obviously. Well, thanks for that. No thanks. problem. 
And Councillor Mackay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Fiona. It's again uh, in terms of boundary and pedestrian access. When you went through the slide presentation, you showed us very clearly uh, about some of the desire lines and that some of the desire lines were taking us directly into the shopping centre. When I look at the site and the red line area, I don't see that there is any access point from the site to what the area is that's the shopping centre. In other words, there's no follow through of anything that would be desire lines. Uh, that are being used at the moment, which is the justification of the pedestrian access from Cumbria and from Heston Place. Could you just clarify all of that for me, please? Thank you. Yeah, certainly, I'll, I'll, I'll do my best. Um, there is pedestrian access from the estate into adjoining streets, and there's three points on the plan on page 108. Um, However, there is no link shown into the retail park. So if they were, if anybody from the area wanted to go into the retail, retail park, they would have to walk through the estate onto Glasgow Road and round into the retail park that way. There is no link from the site into the retail park. Does that clarify your question? Oh, no, that's certainly how I, read the, how I read the plan. What I'm looking for then is just some further clarification of what the boundary treatment would be that would be uh, erected on the site, the side of the shopping centre now, please, in the proposed plan. Um, just give me one second. I don't have that information on the details that I have before me, Councillor. Um, we do have a condition asking for details of boundary treatment if planning, planning permissions to be approved. Um, so we would know that through the, the discharging of the pre-start planning conditions. That's page, condition 26 on page 99. And again, Fiona, if you could just give us some assistance, please, from your experience. Uh, what would be acceptable to planning? Uh, just to give us uh, what could be presented by developers that would be found acceptable to planning that would meet in with that condition, please. Um, it, it could be a range of, of boundary treatment. Um, the developer may choose to leave it open um, or he may choose to, to fence it off or, or put a wall up. Um, at the point in time, though, I, I don't know, but it could be a range or it could be left open. Sorry, again, just for further clarification, uh, would all three of those options be things that were they presented to planning would be acceptable so therefore would meet in with condition 26. They could do yes. Thank you very much that's helpful thank you. <laughs> Sorry, we're having a wee bit difficulty actually hearing and we think it's because you're actually moving backwards and forwards uh, with, with your mic. So are you okay to? Yeah, okay, that's fine, thanks. Okay, no further questions then. I have I have one. Uh, th there seems to be a lot of, you know, this is, involves obviously a fair bit of undeveloped land. We don't require an environmental survey uh, in, in this case. Uh, um, environmental impact assessment? Yes, no, sorry. We yeah. have screened the application for that and one is not required. Um, but we have done the, the, the obligatory screening that's required under the EIA regs. Okay, thank you. Uh, if there's no other questions then, uh, can we move to a determination? We have, a, if I can find the page. We have a recommendation on page 51 and the, it is recommended that this application for planning permission be approved subject to the conditions and advisory notes listed in Appendix 1 attached to this report, but that the decision notice is not issued until a Section 75 legal assessment has been, agreement, sorry, has been finalised 
as per the heads of terms noted in paragraph C of this report. So that's the recommendation then for approval with conditions. Uh, do we have any comments there? Anybody happy to uh, propose? Councillor Cook, Cook, thanks. Sorry, Chair, just in relation to the conditions, uh, I would like, if possible, to have a, another condition uh, applied, as suggested by uh, Fiona, about the uh, information relating to the ground levels that that has to place entrance and how that's going to be constructed. OK, thanks. Nobody any objection to that addition? And through you, Chair, if possible, just uh, I'm conscious with the terms of the, the recommendation um, there. It refers to the terms of a Section 75 agreement um, in terms of paragraph C of the report. Um, and we just uh, advise members, I think it should refer to the, the terms of a Section 75 agreement to set out in paragraphs 94 and 95 of the report. OK, then, uh, with those amendments or inclusions, uh, do we have a proposal? I think hmm? we're in agreement, Chair, yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll propose. Right. So do we have a seconder? And see, is that Neil with his hand up? Yeah, I'm happy to second right. change those conditions, yeah. Is anybody otherwise minded? OK, then, thank you very much. We have a decision. Lynn? Yep, thank you, Chair. Just before I confirm the decision, members, Councillor Maitland, Councillor McGee, can, I, can you confirm, please, that you are happy with the additional condition regarding the levels of the boundary wall at Heston Place, as um, Councillor Cook had raised? Absolutely, both. Yep, thank you both. In terms of the committee decision, I can confirm that the application has been approved, subject to the conditions and the advisory notes as detailed in the report, as well as an additional condition regarding the clarification of the boundary wall levels at Heston Place, and that the decision notice be withheld until a Section 75 legal agreement has been finalised as per the heads of terms noted in paragraphs 94 and 95 of the report. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. So, moving on then to item five on your agenda, and this is planning application number 20 stroke 0417 stroke PP, proposed a residential development of 28 dwellings with associated infrastructure and landscaping address land to north of Nether Quadrant, Nether Place Quadrant, Mockland, East Ayrshire, by Helix Homes Limited, and that's pages 110 to 142 of your documents. Fiona, over to you again. Thank you. Thank you very much. The application is before the committee today because it has received in excess of 10 objections and under the Council Scheme of Delegation requires to be determined by Planning, com planning Committee. The application has been submitted by Helix Homes and is for the land to the north of Nether Place Quadrant in Mockland for 28 dwellings. The application site lies within the settlement boundary in the outskirts of Mochlin, effectively comprising the remainder of the woods that were once the grounds of Nether Place Mansion House dating from 1620 that was redeveloped at various points before being demolished in the 1960s. The woods have been unmanaged for many years and have a range of trees and shrubs from good condition veteran broad, broadleaf and some evergreen, evergreen specimens to quite damaged specimens as you'll see in the pictures. 28 houses are proposed. Initially it was 29 before being reduced to 28. Um, varying sizes ranging from single storey two bed bungalows to larger five bed detached two storey units. All plots as proposed meet with or are in excess of the private garden ground criteria as laid out in the local development plan. Open space is provided centrally and also in some smaller pockets and there are linkages to the surrounding area to meet with existing paths that are either formal or informal and further information on the development starts at paragraph seven of your papers on page 111. I'm going to try and see if I can get the share screen to work. Everybody see that okay? Yeah, yeah. okie dokie. 
Right, here we have um, Mochun and we have the A76 coming from Kilmarnock heading towards Ochun Lake, Cumnock and beyond to New Cumnock. And here we have the cross at Mochlin and we have the road down towards Ayr and the road up towards Sorn and Catron. And here we have the application site in here just behind the existing residential development of Nether Place Quadrant and in here is Nether Walk. You can see the sort of irregular shaped um, layout of the site. So this is your red line site here. You can see access from Nether Place Quadrant as you come into the site. You can see the layout with some housing as we come in, the open space area and the suds pond, and you can see the developments that moves around. This is the blue line that's referred to in the committee report as land out with the application site, but within the applicant's land ownership. Um, this image has come in from the applicant showing the development kind of overlaid and oops, bear with me. I'm not sure if I can zoom into that if that works for everybody. Um, and you can maybe just see the layout in relation to there. That's the existing Suds Pond and Play area for Nether Place Quadrant in here. And you can just see the layout as it comes in. You can see some of the wooded area, etc. as well, kind of over the layouts kind of overlaid and that's Nether Place, Nether Walk as well. Okay. Sorry, I'm having problems with the share tree this morning. But, um, hopefully that's us there. OK, um, this is the obligatory local development plan. You can see that the red line site is in this area here. You can see just the boundary of the conservation area just over at the eastern boundary of the application site. So the, the, the conservation area is out with the application site. Um, and you can see the application site is in here. We have now some house type plans to show you the range of houses that are being proposed. You can see the rough external the fin, the rough indication of the external finishes and an indication of the design of the houses. Again, this is just a, 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 a plan just showing the, the layout of the site with some of the contours of the land on it too. It's just showing the range of house types, members from bungalows, semi-detached, one terrace unit to the larger units there. Uh, that's just showing the utilities members. Um, this is Nether Place Quadrant. Um, and there's just some showing the application site at the back. The case officer has taken a range of photos here, members, and the case officer is also here today with us online. Uh, Marion Ferguson, if you've got any queries about anything, but she's tried to take a range of photographs at different times of year to show you the tree coverage and how the trees are in, in, in the sort of backdrop of the site. See the backdrop of the site there, members. That's the play, little play area that's already there for Nether Place Quadrant that I showed you earlier, members. And then the sub pond for Nether Place Quadrant is behind there. Looking over the site, there's the this is the sub pond for Nether Place Quadrant, members. You can see over towards the application site. You'll see the desire lines and footpaths and the recreational use of the site, members. You see some areas are fairly clear members, but some areas have a lot more trees in them. You see some of the trees are, 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 are haven't been managed and are, are down. You'll see some of the trees are good specimens and space throughout the site. See the burn there members, which is referred to in the report. Uh, this is just the access point from Nether Place Quadrant into the site. Um, you'll see it there, members. Uh, 
I'll stop sharing now. If anybody wants me to go back there, please just let me know. Turning back to the report in terms of consultations, we have no, uh, no objections from ARA in terms of traffic design and layout, following some discussions and further information from the applicant. ARA Flooding and SEPA have no objections. We have no comments from Environmental Health Service and Scottish Water in terms of objections. We have covered the comments from the Mochlin Cars team within the report, and we note the comments from Mochlin Community Council regarding trees, which then brings me on to the advice that's in the new report of the Boricultural Officer from the Council, starting at paragraph 17 on page 114. Whilst the Boricultural Officer um, notes that the tree report is generally very good with an accurate categorisation of trees, the Border Cultural Officer is concerned that looking at the plans that the proposed loss of so many trees within the woodland, both from an amenity perspective and also from a safety perspective, as he's learned from previous experience, building houses in and around trees can lead to major safety concerns for main structural roots or severed during development, leaving trees prone to wind blow during storms and being close to property for the structural damage and injury. Removing shelter of large number of trees within the woodland would allow high winds to penetrate further into the wood, which could cause more tree or structural damage. At the very least, his advice would be to retain all category A and B trees and seek replacements for category C trees being removed. It doesn't appear that the proposed layout takes account of the BS standard, which is BS 5837, in terms of retained tree root protection areas are concerned, and the site should be designed around the retained trees, not the other way around. He would be looking for no construction to be carried out in the protected root areas and original ground levels requiring to be retained and blended into the layout out with root protection areas. He also would, seek, be, would be seeking further information regarding utilities and exactly where those are proposed out with the, the root protection zones of retained trees. And he was referring to a shading model for the proposed layout in terms of how long gardens will be in shade to demonstrate how they would be affected in relation to sunshade during the day. Following neighbour notification, public advert of the proposal, we have 26 letters of representation received in two petitions. First of all, five of the letters that have been received support the application, as noted starting at paragraph 29 of the, of the report. In the following matters in summary, great use of scrub, the, the existing scrub woodland. Houses are representative of the local architecture, which is what the village needs to encourage more families. It's an existing parcel of land within the village boundary and close to all facilities to regenerate and bring improvements for the local community. 21 letters of objection have been received with a petition of 19 names and another petition of six names. Now, as noted in your report, there is some duplication to the letters of objection in the petition. However, the points that have been raised start at paragraph 34 of your papers on page 117. The main pertinent points being the town and development pressures, transport and access issues, existing services, use of land for local exercise, recreation and loss of, exist loss of green space that would result, the loss of trees in the wooded area, impact on the village and impacts on wildlife, climate change, impact on trees, wildlife and flooding issues. Sections 25 and 37 two of the Town and Country Planning Act as amended require that planning applications be determined in accordance with the development plan unless material considerations indicate otherwise. The proposal accords with a princi at principal level with the local development plan Proposing residential development, which is in the general location, which in the general location of the LDP directs that where development should go to the settlement boundaries. However, it's considered at a detailed level the proposal, the detailed level, the proposal fails to demonstrate compliance with policies Res 1, E and V9, INF4, and OP1. And you'll see the parts 1, 3, 5, 4, 5, and 11. Having received detailed information on the amount of open space provided, whilst the amount complies with the LD provision, further clarification is required as to function and use. There are material considerations relevant to the assessment of the proposal and the consultation responses show both support and objection, but are on the whole supportive. That, however, is with the exception of the Council's of Border Cultural Officer, who raises significant issues with the proposal and layout in terms of the impact on trees. There is a large body of representation that has been received, which is mainly objections, and we have some weight in these material considerations, in respect, particularly in respect of the loss of trees and habitat and lack of green space. The application raises no issues of neighbouring amenity in respect of the design, but the loss of such a large number of trees, with no explanation as to why some category A, B and C trees in the survey noted for retention are to be proposed on footpaths, culverts, pavements, etc., which will be to the detriment of root plates and overall tree health. The applicant's accompanying reports and material is noted, but there is insufficiency in some respects, such as trees and bats, to suggest overall support. 
Material considerations are noted, but do not suggest approval of the application in light of the otherwise non-compliance with certain local development plan policies. And noting the consultation response and discussions with the Council's Water Cultural Officer, the application is therefore recommended for refusal, subject to the reasons listed in the sheet in Appendix 1 of your report. Chair. Uh, thank you, Fiona. Uh, do we have any questions, clarifications uh, required, members? I see Councillor Campbell, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Fiona, I just wondered if, um, given comments on infrastructure, uh, were the NHS and education consulted on this? We haven't consulted the NHS or education members. It's a small site of 28 units and it's on white land within the settlement boundary. So we haven't consulted them on that basis. Oh, David, do you want to come in? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Just to, just to advise, uh, Councillor, that obviously all sites are reviewed by the, uh, the local development plan team and obviously that while this site doesn't form part of it for all the, uh, the areas of health and social care, uh, that consultation is taken uh, through the LDP team at that particular stage. So just to update each councillor. Okay, thank you. Thank you, David. Anyone else? Matters for clarification? No. Okay, then, in, in that case, perhaps we can move to a determination. We do have a recommendation in front of us which is on page 110 of your, of your papers. Uh, it is recommended that this application planning permission be refused, subject to the reasons listed on the attached sheet in Appendix 1 of this report. Uh, any comment, proposal? Sure. Councillor Cook, thanks. Yeah, Chair, just to move refusal for the reasons outlined in the report. Okay. And I'm happy to second. Okay, thank you. Is anyone otherwise minded? No. Okay, in that case, if no one's otherwise minded, we have a decision. Uh, Lynn, thanks. Thank you, Chair. The decision of the committee is that the application has been refused for the reasons detailed in the report. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. And thank you, members. OK, on to item six on our agenda. And this is planning application number 20 stroke 0081 stroke PP, erection of a new office unit, new turnstile entrance, memorial garden, new shop and changing facilities, formation of a nine aside and five aside pitch, which doubles as the pan zone on match day, the installation of 10 number 10 meter high floodlights and the erection of a two meter high boundary fence at Kilmarnock Football Club Limited, Rugby Park, Rugby Road, Kilmarnock East Ayrshire by Mr. Billy Bowie, uh, Kilmarnock Football Club. And Fiona, I believe you're up again. Yes, I am. I'm just trying to sort this presentation. OK, um, this application, as Chair has advised, is by Kilmarnock Football Club. It is for a new office unit, turnstile entrance, memorial garden, shop changing facilities and two training pitches, to, as Chair has advised, to double as the fan zone on match day with the installation of 10 number 10 metre high floodlights and the erection of the boundary wall. The site is out with but adjacent to the conservation area but within the Rugby Park Stadium football, existing Rugby Park Football Stadium complex, which also houses the Park Hotel. Paragraphs 7 and 8 on your papers illustrate a more detailed explanation of your report, of the proposal, and I'll just turn to the screen, if you can just give me a second till I get into screen share mode again. Okay. Hopefully this is us. OK, here we go. Back into the town centre of Kilmar at this time, members. Well, here's the town centre here. You'll see the one-way system in this respect, and you'll see Dundonald Road here. 
we have Rugby Park in just in here, members, and you've got the A71 that takes you from the Belfield Interchange to um, Cross House and Moorfield round here, um, just so you can get your bearings, but you can see the Red Line site, which is part of the overall football ground. In a little bit more detail, member here is the Memorial Garden, which you can see just in here, and I've got an image of it in a minute or two. You can see the T-shaped um, building with the um, turnstiles, etc. underneath. You'll see the two training pitches, members, and um, I'm just trying to see if anything else I need to show you. Um, but you've got the larger pitch and the smaller pitch here, members, and you'll have some boundary treatment, which I've also got a wall. A plan to show you in two seconds once I get to that plan. Uh, you have the obligatory local development plan map members, and you can see the red line site just in here, and you'll see the Dundonald Road conservation area boundary members just at the very back of the, boundary of the, the football stadium running here. So we have the building here as proposed members. You can see it here. You can see the turnstiles underneath and you'll see the, the office accommodation, etc., as part of the proposal. You just see a layout plan here, members, of um, ground and upper floor. So that's the turnstile arrangements there. That's Memorial Garden, and you'll just see details in there. The two pitches, members, as you can see here. This is the Memorial Garden. You can see it's quite small scale, members. Um, and you'll see the little planting, etc. Um, but it's just a sort of memorial garden, really, just as the club wish to propose. Um, but you'll see the small scale nature of it and the landscaping and the boundary wall, etc. and the plaques that they wish to display um, in terms of their memorial. Uh, you'll see the existing bound the boundary wall and the details there with the fencing above members. Um, if I can just scroll in a little bit here, everybody can see it. Um, you can see the line of the the the, 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 bound, the, the wall, the, the fence there, um, boundary treatment just along there, members. Photos. Here's the application site. Here you can see it's currently used as parking. You can see the, the, the football stand, which I think is the Moffat stand. Let's refer to the report. Okay, so if I stop the share trait, turning back to the report to summarise the consultation process, ADA in traffic terms has no objections to the application as we note in paragraph 14. ADA flooding can now confirm that after some extended discussions back and forth with the applicant's agent, they have no objections as per paragraph 15 of your report. Sport Scotland don't object. The inclusive design, ad, ad, um, design advisor um, comments can be relevant as relevant can be addressed by conditional advisory note in the event of any approval by members. The points raised by environmental health at paragraph 25 are noted, can be addressed by condition in respect of noise matters and acoustic barriers. In terms of the representation process, we've received 15 objections and one letter of support, and there is one neutral letter in terms of the opinion on the proposals. In summary, the objections relate to the hours of operation of the pitches being set to protect amenity of residents and general loss. Uh, noise impacts and plans to mitigate noise, boundary wall queries, traffic matters and loss of parking, ownership certification matters, pitches only being for club use, information on flood lighting, overdevelopment, health and safety matters, which are a separate issue relative to the stadium certificate, impact from the conservation area, acoustic fence, concern about levels, queries over a PA system and litter and, and bins, etc. The points of letter of objections, oh, sorry, the points in the letters of support are noted in paragraph 34, page 150, and each of the clarif and each 
point is clarification on each point is also provided and the neutral letter as clarified in paragraph 35 on the same page. Town Country Planning Scotland Act of 97 requires that applications are determined in accordance with the development plan unless indicated otherwise. Overall, we feel the proposal can be justified against the policies of the local development plan. There are material considerations relevant to the application and it's considered on balance that these are largely supportive of the application on the whole. Post development is of an acceptable scale and design is consistent with the adjacent and associated uses of sports stadium and the operation of Kilmarnock Football Club. The finishes will be in keeping with the existing stadium and will not adversely impact upon the visual amenity of the surrounding area. Boundary treatments are proposed and mitigation is outlined within the noise impact assessment, seeking to ensure that there will be no significant or unacceptable issues from a residential amenity perspective. The proposal will relocate food Football club facilities from temporary buildings to a permanent base adjacent to the ground. Proposal will offer permanent facilities associated with the running of the club and the training pitches and flood lighting will support the existing use as a sports ground. In terms of the memorial garden, as I've shown you, it will be located at the northernmost point of the site and will face towards the existing access road and car parking opposite the park hotel. It is small in scale and is considered to provide a feature including landscaping to the stadium. Post development has been designed to reflect the colour and appearance of the adjacent ancillary sports ground as considered to be in keeping with the general appearance of the immediate area. Proposal will redevelop tarmac area of ground to the south of, of Rugby Park that can, currently serves as additional car parking and the concourse behind the football stand. Given the location of the site and its current use, ARA have no objections to the proposal and it will not impact upon existing vehicle access, egress and circulation strategy, as well as the football club and the parking, parking arrangements for the park hotel. The Environmental Health Service has been fully consulted on the noise and lighting implications of the proposal and following a, re a review of the lighting planning calculations and noise impact assessment, Environmental Health have no objections to the subject to the acoustic fencing being implemented on site. Mm -hmm. proposal is not considered to have, therefore, to have a significant unacceptable impact on the residential amenity of the neighbouring property. It's therefore recommended that the application be approved and if I would be able to ask for members' indulgence on page 167. Starting at page 167, you've got your conditions, members. Um, on, pa on paragraph 168, you've actually got condition number six. Um, I noticed when I was going through the report yesterday that the case officer hasn't put in an implementation part to that condition. So we've asked for details and proposed levels, albeit the site is fairly flat. We've asked them just as a matter of security and for information. So we have that, that detail, but I would like to make that condition 6A and add in a 6B to say that the existing, the approved, approved levels will be implemented on site prior to the development being brought into use and being maintained thereafter in perpetuity as per the approved details. Apologies, members. I only noticed yesterday that that hadn't actually been added. Um, other than that, members, we would recommend the conditions that are in your report um, as detailed. Thank you. Thank you, Fiona. Uh, members, any questions for Fiona for clarification? Thanks. Yeah, Councillor Cook, Cook, thank you. Thanks, Chair. Uh, I was going to comment in relation to the Memorial Garden because it looked as if there were steps included in the, in the, the information that's provided, but I noticed there's a condition on that to make it fully accessible, so, so that's fine. I'm just wondering, in relation to the existing turnstiles and wall, is that, it wasn't clear from the drawing, is that being demolished as part of this proposal and that wall effectively brought forward to the edge of the car, existing car park? Yeah, but Thanks, Chair. Yeah, the, the, there's obviously quite a bit of work getting carried out to the, the access arrangements into the ground. Obviously, uh, some of those uh, matters will go beyond planning. Uh, obviously, the in terms of the, the, the safety certificate for the, the, the stadium, we'll have to consider the access and the egress, which was looking to, to provide the turnstile arrangement into the east stand and exit gate and then to ensure that, you you, you know, the public and supporters will be able to go into to the east stand via the new access uh, along this uh, long you know, corridor. But the corridor, if you can imagine, will be have a boundary fence or boundary wall on one side and a uh, fence on the other. And at the the other side, the, the existing arrangement will be will be modified so that the uh, access arrangement into the 
the, what will be the Muffet stand will be in and through the the, the new uh, access arrangement at the the office accommodation and shop. Hopefully that clarifies, Councillor Cook. Yeah, no, fine, David. Thanks for doing that. Anyone else? No, OK, I've got a few questions for Mike Fiona. Fiona, I asked you at Chair's briefing if we knew whether uh, this uh, was going to be open to the public for rent for the public, these pitches, or whether it's for the football team. Did we manage to get any clarification on that? Yes, apologies, I forgot to say that earlier. Um, it is for the football club, and there's also a condition number 12 on page 169 that says it shall be in the football club and not rented out for commercial basis. Thank you very much. Uh, I have a, another question. Uh, I think this is okay, but I just wanted to check. It's on page 163 and it's paragraph 66. It says in the paragraph, in an exercise of this nature, it is usual to measure the sound from existing sports pitches and then use the results to obtain to predict the levels that emanate from the proposed ones. Uh, I suppose I would be more concerned about the noise emanating from a fan zone. Uh, I mean, I take it a fan zone is, I'm not quite sure what they are, I've seen them on the television, but I take it there are places where the fans can go and they can have an alcoholic drink that wouldn't be allowed inside the uh, inside the football. No, that's not what it is. Could you, could you uh, disabuse me, please? <laughs> Um, as far as I'm aware, um, I don't, I can't comment on the alcoholic side of it, um, but it's a gathering area for fans to go into, from my understanding. Um, the comment there is, a, it's an extract from uh, the noise impact assessment that's been undertaken on behalf of the applicant, and it's not been raised in response by Environmental Health. So, um, Environmental Health, if they weren't happy with that yeah. evaluation, would have come back and commented, and they haven't. But uh, Hopefully that answers yeah. at least some my, of your questions. My, question about the, my yeah. question is about the fact that it's talking about noise from football pitches, but it doesn't mention what noise might come from a fan zone. Uh, no. That, so, now, uh, uh, it may be that there's less noise comes from a fan zone. Uh, it may be that the acoustic material they're putting up is going to control that. It's just the, the fan zone, noise from a fan zone, I don't find mentioned in the report. That, that's all I'm querying and asking about. Thanks, Chair. I mean, what, what they currently have as a fan zone is is in the same locality. Uh, they, they have an area where it's a temporary, uh, a temporary football park, and an area where there's def, you know inflatables. Uh, so it's really an area for the children to go into, uh, and there's no alcohol uh, in that that uh, particular area. All the alcohol is within the licensed premises. So it's not a Glasgow Green issue then? No. Okay, that clarifies. No, not that type of fan zone <laughs> or big TVs either. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. That clarifies matters for me. Thank you. Yeah. Just shows you shows you how much I know about football. Eh? But I suppose as a Hearts fan, you can't expect much more. Councillor Campbell, Campbell, thanks. Uh, thanks, Chair. I'm just wondering if we could consider the point made in paragraph 34 with regard to the fact that there are no proposed hours of operation of the nine-a-side and five-a-side pitches, and it's suggested that there could be a condition restricting the times of operation of the floodlighting. So I, I'm just wondering if, if that's a possibility. Um, I, I wonder if somebody could, could guide me on this, please. Yep, I'm just trying to find the condition for you, if you can just bear with me. Just two seconds. Having worked on it during the week, I've now lost sight of it. Through you, Chair, if it helps members, Fiona, um, I understand that um, there are suggested conditions on page 169. Um, Fiona's already alluded to uh, proposed condition 12 over the the, the, the restriction of the, yep. the use of the pitches um, and I think condition 13 talks about the, the lighting, for the, the, the flood lighting, but I'll let Fiona come in. Um, yes, we haven't um, excluded the use of it because it's within an existing sports ground and um, sports stadium which is used for the purposes of, 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 of the game of football. What we have however done is limited the flood lighting details um, relative to the use of the flood lighting so that with the exception of match days, they are not on after 9 p.m. at night. Um, the reason we have accepted match days out of that was after a discussion that I had 
um, with David McDowell relative to the fact that the police will control the activities on match days, so there may be limited um, times on match days when it will have to be later. But other than that, we have um, limited the hours of the flood lighting to 9pm at night, which we think is reasonable, um, given the existing use of the complex as a football stadium. Thank you, and thank you, Craig, for helping me out till I found the condition. So that, like, that relates to the, the nine-a-side and five-a-side pitches. Sorry, can you say that again? I didn't catch you. So, sorry, so, so that condition relates to the nine-a-side and five-a-side pitches. Yes, it does. It relates to the, the, the flood lighting on those pitches, yes. OK, thank you. Anything else for clarification, folks? No, OK then. Uh, I'd like to move to a determination then. Uh, we have a recommendation on page 143. And the recommendation is that the Planning Committee approve the planning application subject to conditions are detailed in Appendix 1 at the end of the report. Can I come in? Sorry to interrupt you. Would it be possible to add in the change that I asked for, for Condition 6 at page 168? Page Sorry if you were about to say that. If that's okay. Pardon it is okay. I'd actually forgotten, Fiona. So thank you very much for, for reminding me. Uh, OK, we, we'll take it with that added in, unless anybody uh, voices a, a, a otherwise a, a comment at the moment. So, folks, do we have someone willing to propose this and second it with uh, that amendment in? Okay. Councillor McGee, is that a proposal? Yeah, absolutely, but with the conditions and the added condition to you. Thank you. Thank you. And do we have a seconder? Yeah, so, I see uh, yeah. Councillor. I see Councillor Campbell. I think I see. Is that Councillor Field with a hand up? Uh, we also have Sorry. Councillor Mayor, do you have a comment? Sorry, Chair. I was just uh, going to second the proposal. Okay, that's fine. Th thank, thank you. Well, in that case, I think we have a determination. Uh, over to you, Lynn. Yep, thank you, Chair. The decision of the committee is that the application has been approved, subject to the conditions and for the reasons detailed in the report, as well as the amended condition 6 regarding the approved levels to be implemented on site and maintained in perpetuity. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Lynn. And uh, members, we're moving on now to agenda item number 7. It's the planning application number 20 stroke 0132 stroke PP application for planning permission for alterations to proposed site layout and changes to house types to phase 2C and 2D on plots. And I'm not going to read out every single number, uh, but you can see them there for yourself. Uh, 17 plots, it's retrospective, and it's at proposed housing development, Riggs Roads, Cumnock, East Ayrshire, by Mr. John Campbell and Fiona. I believe you're on again, thank you. How's your voice holding out? Thank you, Chair. Uh, the application is before committee today as it has received in excess of 10 objections and under the Council scheme of delegation, it requires to be determined by the planning committee. The application site lies, out, lies within the settlement boundary in the outskirts of Cumnock, just off Rig Road at the Auckland Lake side of the settlement and is an allocated development opportunity site for housing in the local development plan. Currently undergoing construction by the applicant for 156 houses. This application seeks to change the approved scheme on the site on certain areas of the site. And this application is further to a planning application that the committee refused in December last year. The application site covers the same site as that application from December but it removes two of the plots where the main concerns of the planning authority were. If members remember back in December, we couldn't part approve and part approve the application. And we had said that provision that from the details of the plans at the time, that our main concern was about four, four plots um, down the bottom of the area. We've had clarification that two of those plots are, are generally acceptable when we've evaluated this application, but that this application is further to the previous submission that we had um, late last year. Further background in that respect is given in paragraph 5 of your report on page 173. So moving on to paragraph 6, planning permission is now sought under the current application for the change of house types 
to 15 plots in previously approved plot locations and the siting of two new plots in the area of land previously approved as public open space or drainage area, noting that there is no overall increase in the approved 156 units via the parent consent from 2015. The applicant was advised as a little bit more background upon lodging the previous application, which was determined in December that the planning service may not support the additional four units in the proposed location, noting that the area was intended for surface water drainage reasons as approved in the drainage strategy on the main site. That area was to have both overground attenuation on the west side and underground attenuation on the east side, and a pumping station was also proposed. The land was also designated as an amenity buffer zone with public open space separating the new estate from existing houses in the surrounding area. The current application um, now proposes two units in this area of open space and then remaining the remain leaving the remainder of the open space and that removes the two most southern units proposed in the previous application. The house type changes remain the same as the previous submission. I'll just return to the plans and hopefully get this to work for you again. So the overall site of the main of the primary residential development is in here. And what to, today we are concerned with this area down in this red line site area here. So there's the overall site for you, members of the units. And this is the area in this area that we are concerned about most. If you remember last year, members, this is the area here where we had issues with plots being located um, in terms of the amenity buffer space onto properties down here as well. So you'll see that there's two more unit, two units there, but overall, as I said to you, there's still 156 units in its entirety. So just to show you the obligatory LDP plan, that's the area here, and you can see the kind of peach color um, um, is just to show you that it is a, it's, it's an allocated housing site. So we have some of the details of the um, house type plans for you members. You'll see this one is single storey at the rear with velux windows into the roof space and dormers at the front. Think two storey here, members. Single storey bungalow here. Uh, one and a half storey at the front, members, with um, roof lights at the back. Um, you'll see some photos of the site under construction members. I'll just run through those. This is the, um, as far as it's completed at the moment. OK, so turning back to the report, in terms of consultations, we have no objections from ARA in terms of traffic and design layout. ARA flooding also have no objections. Following neighbour notification and public advert, 13 letters of objection have been received. One of these letters didn't object, but made further, sorry, apologies, 13 letters of representation have been received. One letter did not object, but has made comments. The following points in summary have been raised, although the report outlines these in more detail, starting at paragraph 11 on page 175. The future change to designate areas of open space and assurance is sought in this regard. Continuation of major groundworks and changes in natural drainage with the influx of surface water. Negative impacts and amenity from changes in house type that will be intrusive to neighbours with an overbearing effect. No contour and selection on the section plans, plans provided. Earlier drainage installed remains an open ditch at risk of collapse. The lack of trust in the, del in the delivery of the working methods of the applicant. Indicate indications of detention ponds and surface water and, and swales are not noted in the plans. Layout changes bringing concerns of public access along the rear of properties. The landscape master plan being out of date. Concerns regarding ARA matters that were raised at the lack of an RCC and wish from ARA that no building warrants were granted until this was addressed. Just on that point, members, if I can clarify, that's a separate legal process and not a material planning consideration. New houses being built closer to existing properties, queries over the proposed drainage arrangements and requests for conditions relative to screen planting and fencing. All objections are outlined in detail in the report and also responded to. 
Town and Country Planning Scotland Act, as amended, requires that planning applications be determined in accordance with the development plan, unless material considerations indicate otherwise. Not all of the appropriate policies of the East Ayrshire Local Plan are met with, but to a much lesser extent than the previous application. In, in particular, we now have information on levels that have been provided and assessed above in the report. The drainage strategy approved for the site shows engineering works for the land to the north of Hunters Way, and further information on surface water disposal has been communicated to ARA, who are now satisfied that surface water management and attenuation can be adequately addressed with suitable planning conditions. Most southern plots 102 and 105 in the previous application have been omitted. The assessment concerns the proposal as a whole, and by and large, the issues raised by the proposal are negative and positive in terms of the effect of the proposal on adjacent properties. There are some feeling of overbearing from the larger substituted house types, but in recognition of this, the developer has provided a landscape buffer to minimise potential activity levels, which could normally be associated with having gardens back to back. The imposition of conditions governing boundary treatments and screenings and securing its use as a buffer rather than of active open space will help alleviate concerns and activity levels from public use. In terms of the buffer zone, the garden for plot 101 is unnecessarily large and, constricts the buffer and can restrict the buffer zone, including its intended effect. And by reducing the buffer zone for plot 101, the proposal will apply with, comply with our local development plan policies and a condition is suggested to have a revised site plan. This would ensure that remaining issues thereafter accord with the LDP. The material considerations are noted and it's considered on balance that these are supportive and not in support. In particular, the matters not in support note their body of objections, which raise issues as I have highlighted to you already. On balance, whilst it's considered that drainage matters might have been satisfactorily addressed, there are still concerns and overbearing changes from what was single storey to larger units, but in mitigation, these have been reduced in number and the buffer zone proposed. On balance, the objections are of some weight, but are not considered to, sufficient to outweigh the general compliance of the proposal. It's therefore recommended that we approve the application subject to conditions, and if it's possible, members, with your indulgence, if I could add in a late condition further to discussion with environmental health, um, Environmental Health has requested a dust management plan be added, and that would be substituted as conditions seven and eight, if at all possible, members. Condition seven would require the submission of the dust management plan, and condition eight would require its implementation during the construction works. Thank you, Chair. Thank, thank you, Fiona. Uh, members, do we have any uh, questions, Fiona, for clarification? Do we see anybody? Councillor Mayor. Thanks, Chair. Uh, on page seven, sorry, there's a lot of interference. Can you hear me? Thanks, Chair. Uh, on page Better 173, now, page 173, paragraph five, the last sentence. Since then, a range of applications have been submitted many of which were retrospective to regularise works carried out that were not in accordance with approved plans. I'm a bit concerned about that. I think Fiona mentioned in the report something about the some of the uh, objectors had raised issues of, of trust in the developer. And from what I'm reading in the tail end of paragraph five, that might be justified. Could someone comment on this or are we doing anything about it? or? Does this developer just do what he likes and then gets permission afterwards? Thank you. I'll come in on that, Chair. Yeah, David, thank you. I think the quick answer to that is no, he doesn't get to do what he likes, but we, we've taken a, a range of enforcement action against the developer. As members will remember, this application came before you in December last year. Uh, the application we had identified was a number of uh, issues to do with the uh, the, the surface water drainage and there was objections there from ARA flooding. Uh, we we raised these concerns with the developer and the developer chose at his own risk to, to proceed w without taking that forward. We gave him the option to have the application uh, put back so that we could get further information, advertise it, take that on board and then take that forward. He chose not to and uh, he chose to for the application to be determined. We brought that in front of uh, members in December, and you will recall, Councillor Mayor, that you attended a site visit and to see the site. Uh, hopefully, at that particular time, you were updated by colleagues to to identify where uh, the, the issues were in terms of the the developer, what enforcement actually been taken to date, 
uh, how we've tried to work with the developer, how we've tried to deal with the, the, the range of complaints that have been received. Uh, from the the adjacent owners and and there is there is obviously a breakdown of trust here between the the neighbours and the developer. However, our position is to, to deal with the statutory requirements. And as I say, we we've taken enforcement action. We've had to we were a a, a short period of time away from uh, taking uh, you know formal legal action uh, on the developer, but they, they they managed to bring that back with supplying sufficient information. So. We, we are taking this forward. Uh, I know colleagues in other services such as ARA have also had separate discussions with the enforcement uh, relating to those con construction consent. So from a planning and building standards uh, perspective, we have uh, been proactive. We did have a, a meeting with uh, the developer and at that particular time, uh, a whole range of uh, local members. Uh, and uh, that, that, at that particular time, we got commitments from the developer that they would uh, progress to get uh, the matters ratified. And obviously from that, we've now got the application before you today. So hopefully that uh, gives you a summary, Councillor Mayor, and I'm happy to answer any further questions on it. Councillor Mayor? No, that's fine, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Chair, uh, I would just to also come in, um, while well, noting what uh, David McDill has just uh, uh, said there, um, what I would, I would also remind members in any event is notwithstanding um, the points that have been made by David, um, as members will be aware, um, the fact that um, there have been um, retrospective applications, including I know that this one being retrospective is not um, a matter that um, you should take account of today. Um, as you're aware, this particular application does require to be deal dealt with on its planning merits, um, having regard to the development plan and any other material considerations. Okay, thanks for that clarification. Do we have any more questions for Fiona? Councillor Mackay. Apologies, Chair. No, Councillor Mayor has asked the question that I wanted and I'm satisfied with the answer that I've had. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Do we have anybody else? No, okay. Can we move to a determination then? We have a recommendation. Uh, and that recommendation... Oh, sorry, Councillor Crawford. Missed you. Sorry. Councillor Crawford. To move the recommendation with the condition. Move the recommendation. Okay. Do we have a seconder? With the conditions. With the conditions, yeah. And I see, I'm not sure whose hand that is, I can see. Neil. Councillor McGee. Yeah. Yeah, so, sorry, Neil, I can only see the top of your head. Sorry. <laughs> that, that's, that's fine. Thing. That's why I, I, couldn't, I, I couldn't identify the, the, the top of the forehead. Okay, then, we have a proposal on a second. There is anybody otherwise minded? No? Okay. In that case, we have a decision. Lynn? Thank you, Chair. The decision of the committee is that the application has been approved. Excuse me, subject to the conditions and for the reasons detailed in the report, and also including the additional conditions regarding the submission and implementation of a dust management plan. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Lynn. So we are ready to move on to item eight, but before we do so, I would like to take one minute to converse, converse with Craig over a matter to do with it. I'm not going to call a recess, folks, because it'll take literally one minute. So uh, let me do that and then we'll get on to uh, item number eight. Okay, okay, folks. Uh, that that as I say, it was only going to take two minutes. Uh, Craig, uh, Craig's going to just clarify something. Uh, it was just a wee concern I had, but Craig, Craig will clarify. 
Thank you, Chair. Uh, the, there was just a, a quick query there that was uh, raised by the Chair in relation to um, the, the, the Code of Conduct um, in relation to um, any uh, impact of this proposed development regarding um, the, the galleon and whether that had an impact uh, you know, on anyone. But as advised to the Chair, clearly right at the very start of this meeting, um, anyone who felt that the, they may have required to declare an interest were afforded uh, the opportunity to do so, and clearly there were no declarations of interest that were uh, highlighted. In any event, as members are aware, this is an application under Section 42 of the Town and Country Planning Scotland Act 1997, and as such, we are merely concerned with an application before us, which is to um, ask that certain conditions um, are not complied with in the uh, original um, planning application. So therefore, the principle of the development in any event is not an issue uh, for uh, members uh, in, in any event. Um, so given the fact that we're not dealing with the principle of development and also we've already dealt with whether or not um, any member is a member of the, 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 the galley. And, uh, uh, for me, the, the matter has already been uh, dealt with earlier on the, the, the agenda and there were no declarations noted in any event. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for uh, clarifying that for me and for the rest of the, man the, the members, uh, Craig. So, uh, without further ado then, the last item on our agenda is agenda item number eight. It's the planning application number 19 stroke 0564 stroke PP, further planning application under section 42 of the Town and Country Planning Scotland Act 1997 to not comply with conditions associated with planning consent 17 stroke 0865 stroke PPP, mixed use development comprising enterprise and innovation centre live work studio, urban wave surf leisure swimming pool, including children's innovation hub nursery, class 11, light manufacturing, class 5 stroke 6 office, class 4, ancillary retail, class 1, food and drink, class 3, residential affordable housing, which will be 33.3% quotient, renewable energy centre, place of worship, class 10, sustainable district heating network, <gasps> Geothermal deep well technology, urban park landscaping, a road and infrastructure improvements at land at Bermoral Road, Hill Street, Witch Road, Balmoral Road, Kilmarnock, East Ayrshire, by the Halo Kilmarnock Limited. Fiona, once again, thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, the application is by Halo Kilmarnock Limited, and as Chair has advised, it's a further application under Section 42 of the Town and Country Planning Act not to comply with conditions associated with the, the patent planning and principal consent from 2017. Further details are, as Chair has um, advised to you in the introduction to this item, and are also outlined in your report. Paragraph 7 on page 205 explains the background to the application, further to the planning permission and principle that was granted in 2018. The site is the former Diageo complex in Hill Street, centrally located in Kilmarnock, other than the area occupied by Kilmar Ayrshire College. The conditions were deemed inappropriate to attach to the grant of a planning permission in principle, as with further similar developments, a number of site-wide conditions which usually require to be discharged prior to work starting on site are either fundamental to the assessment of the development to have cited this information before allowing works to proceed. Conditions usually concern surveys and information that require to be assessed before development can take place, which is the general format for PPP applications that begin relatively high level and don't contain much in the way of detail at times. The only part of the approval on site is the Enterprise and Innovation Hub. The applicants noted at an early stage that they would not be able to, not be likely to be able to comply with the majority of site-wide conditions, the main reason being that the HALO project was parted to various funding sources and these were not all available at the start of development to allow funding of works to discharge all site-wide conditions. Funds were, however, available to discharge the Enterprise and Innovation Hub, which is on site. For, noters, for noting, members are advised that the negative suspensive conditions attached to the patent PPP consent do not necessarily force the developers to undertake physical works to any part of the site, more so they are a timing issue that require the developers to produce reports and underlying matters that they require to be addressed before works can commence, such as reports on contamination, the coal mining legacy and how features are to be remediated. It's unusual for such site-wide conditions to be disaggregated, as often one part of the site will have a corresponding effect on another part, for example, in drainage. Such large redevelopment sites generally need to be 
assessed holistically and not on a phased basis. Notwithstanding, that this, the developers' agents have provided a set of suggested conditions similar to those already approved for the PPP parent consent, but changing the wording to relate to phasing of the site and to be relevant to each particular phase as it comes forward. Phasing of the site is subject to condition one of the parent planning permission principle, which hasn't been discharged. The applicants' agents have within this application effectively suggested that the phasing of the site be extended to site-wide negative suspensive conditions in order that these distinct parcels of land can be treated independently, as that is the way they are funded moving forwards in terms of site deliverability. If I can just turn to the screens. OK, this is the last time, members, that we'll have the screens on just now. But just for clarification, here is the application site in here, the site of the former Diageo complex, and here is Ayrshire College down here. You have the town centre, so it's right immediately to the north of the town centre. We have the um, railway station just in here, and we have the one-way system around here with Glasgow Road up here and Western Road there. So just to give you your bearings, members. Again, it's the miscellaneous development site for the mixed use that Councillor um, Jenkins, as chair, has read out to you today. So here's the obligatory um, local development plan map. And here is the red line site plan identified by the applicants with the general layout. And here is the um, images of the Enterprise and Innovation Hub. And some photographs online. As you can see, work's progressing. If you could just bear with me one moment. Apologies, I was just being asked a question by Craig there, so I had to stop for a minute or two. Uh, sections 25 and 37.2 of the Town and Country Planning Scotland Act, as amended, require planning applications be determined in accordance with the development plan, unless material considerations indicate otherwise. As noted in the report, given the subject matter of the application, most relevant policies are contained within the East Ayrshire Local Development Plan. Proposal accords overall with the development plan, including the suggested conditions. Consultees noting whether the, the conditions can be varied, and in the case of the consultees who advise, they still require the site-wide conditions to be undertaken as a whole. These conditions can be varied to require the information provided out with the enterprise and innovation phase, which is effectively substantially complete. There are material considerations relevant to the assessment of the proposal, and the consultation responses are noted above. Consultation responses show both support and objection, but are on the whole supportive. No objections or representations are received and there's no issues of amenity and it's therefore recommended that planning permission be granted in accordance with the conditions in Appendix 1 of your report. Uh, Chair. Just give us a second, Paul. We're going to have a recess for two minutes, uh, folks. So it's 11.30, let's say 11.33. Okay.
Okay, folks, that's 11.33, and uh, <clears throat> we've, we've had some clarification. Craig's just going to take you through what the issue was and explain what was going on. Thank you. I I'll take you through Sorry, if that, you're, okay. if you're right. And then Craig can come in if he wants to mop yes, up. Yes, that's fine. Me. OK, as long as we have um, clarification as to what okay. was happening. Apologies, members. Um, we have just realised that there is a legal agreement to do with this parent application. So prior, if members choose to grant consent to vary the wording of the conditions now, what we would need to do is ask members' indulgence to amend the propose the recommendation to say that planning permission is granted subject to the conditions, but prior to any decision being released, the section 69 agreement, which was signed relative to the payment of developer contributions, be amended in order that this application number can be recorded within that legal agreement. And I think that's probably us, but Craig can come back in if he wishes. Thank you, Chair. As you know, as members will, will be aware, the effect of any Section 42 application is to create a new planning permission. Um, and uh, what Fiona was just clarifying there was whether or not there's an extant um, legal agreement in place for um, this site. And therefore, if members uh, were to... Um, we're minded ultimately to approve this application, then what we would need to do is ensure that the legal agreement um, that is currently there would also tie into what would effectively be a new planning permission in the event this application is granted. So what Fiona is, has suggested is that the recommendation would require to be altered um, similar to one of the recommendations earlier um, in this committee, which would effectively be that it would be recommended um, that the application um, for uh, planning permission be approved subject to the conditions listed on the attached sheet, but that the decision notice be withheld until um, you know an appropriate legal agreement is, is entered into um, uh, and, and duly um for, you know, formalised. The reason being that um, that we would require to tie that legal agreement to this application. Um, hopefully, that that sort of explains uh, matters. But again, I'm happy to answer any particular questions that there may be arising. So that would be the proposed amendment to the recommendation. Okay, thanks. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask. Uh, if anybody has any points for clarification on this individual matter at this time. And then once that's been done, we'll go back to Fiona and allow her to finish her. You, you're done. OK, then. So in that case, I'll change what I was saying. Uh, do we have any points for clarification either on this matter or on uh, the presentation that Fiona gave us? Thank you. Nothing from anyone? No? Yes. Uh, Councillor Cook. Cook, thank you. Thanks, <clears throat> thanks, Chair. I'm just trying to put this into kind of simple terms that I can understand. Really what the applicant is saying is that the, the, the regional planning application was granted for the whole site with a number of conditions. Because they're now doing it in a phased approach, they're saying they can't comply with the whole lot of the conditions at this time. So they want to do it on a step-by-step -step basis as each phase comes on. Is that really what the, the crux is? Thanks. Effectively, yes. Um, I don't know whether Marion wants to add anything as, as planning case officer. I know Marion is online with us today and she's had quite a quiet day so far. But yes, effectively, that would be my opinion. But perhaps Marion might just like to come in and say clarify us your hand up. Marion, thanks. Thanks, Chair. Yes, um, exactly as Councillor Cook says, they've proposed that they deal with the application conditions discharge uh, and any subsequent planning application to be on a phased basis. And what we've assessed that as being um, appropriate for the, the most part, with the exception of the coal authority conditions, um, surface water conditions and the travel plan condition. Um, so we've Proposed that the rest be varied on a, on a, a phased basis, but out with the enterprise and innovation centre being actually built, um, we've we've proposed that conditions on surface water management, the green travel plan, and coal mine entries reports don't be varied 
to that extent, but they still have to provide them before development commences in any other respect. Thanks. Thank Thanks for clearing that up. Thank you. Okay. Councillor okay. Councillor Mackay, thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, I think the question is just to ask for some clarification if, if we accept the principle of this phased report, we've heard that we have to then come back to ensure that the legal agreement is tied into these conditions. Are we exposing ourselves to the potential that there could continue to be then changes and will that also mean that we are going to continually then be perhaps updating the legal uh, agreement as the different phases of this project come on board? Through you, Chair. Uh, what I think we are proposing today is that uh, a decision would be taken today that if members were satisfied that the application um, should be approved, it would be subject to the existing legal agreement effectively um, being tied into this application given it, it creates a new planning permission. If that is the case, then... I'm not sure, nor, nor do I think we would in any event um, uh, require for the application to keep coming back and for any amendments to take place because thinking about it, what is being proposed is now that this site will be dealt with on a phased basis. So um, the conditions that are being proposed and tying in this illegal agreement if members were happy with what is be proposed, would allow the site to be developed on that phased basis um, as they move across the site in the way that they want to deal with it. So uh, as we talk it through, um, my view would be, and I know David McDowell uh, may also come in, or Fiona may come in, would be that there would, no, there would be no requirement as such to keep coming back to you members um, for these these matters to be dealt with. Obviously, that's subject to the caveat that, um, you know, should further applications require to be made by the, 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 the applicant, we would obviously have to consider them. But in terms of this application, um, I don't believe that we would need to, to, to keep coming back to you members for decisions. Um, to come back in with yourself, Chair, um, I would agree with Craig. The only reason this is coming now is it relates to the parent consent. Um, and we're, we're relating it back to the parent consent. Subsequent applications, um, you know, to discharge other conditions, et cetera, um, would be dealt with um, as per the scheme of delegation. So unless the applicant puts in another section 42 to amend the parent consent, we wouldn't be coming back to you unless the scheme of delegation said we had to. OK, we're going to get a full set. I'm oh, going for that. <laughs> oh, you Thanks, go. Chair. No, just, just to give members a bit of clarity in the, the, the background to the reasoning why this would be taken forward, you'll have to understand that there's, uh, to do a development of the, 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 the grand size of uh, the proposals up at HALO, uh, takes a lot of funding, so the, the funding mechanisms are not in place for even all the parts before the, the work's carried out. So hence the reason that, that they're looking to put it in a phased approach. Obviously at the time when the initial application was made, made they, they didn't they, they assumed that funding would would flow, uh, but that hasn't been the case. So each each area of the site is subject to separate funding. And that, that is that is probably why the, the, the phased approaches came forward. And we don't we don't have any great issues with that, but what this consent will do is it'll give us obviously the, the correct uh, parameters around to, to monitor it and make sure that they come in with the future applications. And members will, will be aware from the, the weekly list that there are or there is another application that, that will be will be considering uh, for the site. And that that will be one of a, a number through the until the site's completed. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, David. Uh, Councillor Mackay, you want to come I, back in? 
Thank you very much, Chair. It's just to ask then, for some reassurance, I suppose, that taking this approach is not having the potential of delaying or increasing the time scale that it will take for the development of this site. In other words, I would hope that what we're not going to see is a site which many years hence is still under development. And that we are taking no actions today which has the potential to extend the development timescales for the overall site to completion. Through, through you, Chair. Are you going to take this? Yeah, I just I appreciate the uh, councillors wanting the reassurance. I think the reality here is this puts a legal mechanism in place, but ultimately the with with any development that uh, it's subject to you know funding and to for the developer to bring forward a, a scheme. Uh, our discussions with the developer have been along the lines of phase one was the was the office block and that has been delivered and it's uh, it's now at the uh, implementation stage where they're looking to have a formal opening. The, the, the next stage is obviously there's uh, applications for housing. So all in all, uh, this proposal will allow uh, the, the, you know, the, the proper approach to, to take forward into each particular phase. The, the, the issue ultimately that's been asked is, will this delay it? And I don't think any, any uh, council officer can give a, a you know, any positive or negative comment on that, to be honest, because that it is subject to external funding. Thank you, David. Uh, Councillor Mackay, you, you, any more or is that? Uh, thank you. I hear what's been said. Thank you very much, Councillor. Thank you. Councillor Mayor, then. Thanks, Chair. Uh, I was thinking, obviously, along the same lines of Councillor Mackay, when we talk about the, the funding, uh, you know, not being there yet. My main concern is, are, are we leaving ourselves to risk that the project, you know, might, as Councillor Mackay said, might drag on for years? And understand what David's saying, that if we give planning permission, for any project, you know, that doesn't mean to say it's going to get finished or when it's going to get finished. But I'm wondering if, if we are, uh, I'm quite happy to go along with the recommendation of the the the, the officials, but I'm, I'm concerned that we might be left, as Councillor Mackay has said, with a site that might drag on or, you know, might never be finished. I don't know if there's any any actions we can take or if these actions that we are taking now are sufficient to safeguard the council's position, basically. Thank you. David? Yeah, I'll, I'll through you, Chair. I just I think that to, to answer the, the, the questions that we, we are setting the legal process up to facilitate that, and then it will be for the, the developer and, and that would rely, you know, that would be any developer who's taking a, a development forward then to come forward with a, a, a detailed scheme. We have one in, in particular just now, uh, and that is, uh, you know, the development for, you know, uh, registered social uh, housing within the site. And that will be, uh, you know, we would bring it, take that forward for determination. But uh, again, we don't, as a, the planning authority, have. We can't force them to, do, to to construct these at a particular time, so I can't give you a reassurance to that effect of when it will be, the, the, the development will be completed because they, they have an an, uh, a, an extant uh, consent which they're, they're progressing through in a phase manner. Yeah, thanks, David. I, I mean, I suppose we're in the situation we might be under any developer who is building a, a housing scheme. And they get they get halfway through it and they go bankrupt and we've got half built houses. There must be something the council can do 
at some stage to step in and remove the eyesore. But I, I'm not suggesting for two seconds we're anywhere near that uh, with, with this development, but presumably we're in the same situation there. Exactly, and I, and I appreciate the, the questions that are raised because they're good questions and they cover, they cover probably experience that we've had with that particular situation because we have had a number of uh, residential sites that have uh, been granted consent, built out maybe a percentage of the, the, the site and then uh, w w particularly over the uh, since 2007-2008 onwards where we had a number of sites that, that they just stalled. So we have had that experience but uh, that is not something that we can control. It's not really an issue for the planning, as you say. It's more of an issue for uh, for perhaps other council committees or the full council to see how how these uh, funds would go. And but it's, it's not really for the planning committee. So through through you, chair, I was just going to to, to say, um, obviously the the reason behind this application coming forward is clearly the developer feels that this is the best way that actually the site can be fully and properly implemented, having regard to um, the funding sources available to them. So um, as a consequence of that, what they are looking to do um, is um, ensure that it's built out, you know, in the, the, the correct and proper way, um, uh, rather than there being delays and having to tie everything up before they effectively start. So to that sense, members, clearly they are try, uh, it would appear that they are trying to move this site on um, in the best way that they, they, they can at the moment, and that is in a phased, uh, a phased uh, basis. Um, and to that extent, while it's a mixed use on this site, clearly that would be no different uh, uh, to, to any other developer. Um, irrespective of what the nature of the development is, they would always look to the, the best way to build the site out. And clearly this is what has been proposed before you today as that way, rather than having to wait to the end point um, to get everything in a row before they then start, they are looking to show that this, uh, to show signs of it being built out, you know, in an, in an appropriate way. Thank you, Craig. D Councillor Cook. It's on a similar vein, but the way I, I read this is they've got planning permission for the entire site, which is what they're now trying to vary. They have started work on site, therefore they have complied with the planning and they now have, uh, you know, they, ha they had a time scale to start work. They have started work, so it's up to them, to, I suppose, in terms of the speed that they actually carry out this work, which relates to you know, housing development. They get permission for the whole housing development. Once they start work, then the time limit sort of disappears out the window and they can keep going as long as it takes. Yep, thank you. Any more questions for clarification, folks? No, okay, thank you. Well, in that case, can we move to a determination? Uh, we have a recommendation and the recommendation is that the application is approved as amended. Uh, uh, subject to the conditions listed on the attached sheet. And that amendment is a, a condition which has been added regarding the and legal it's agreement. Also, it's also subject to a legal agreement. Yeah. Okay, so that is the uh, the recommendation. Do we have a proposer? A proposal, I should say. Councillor Mackay? Uh, thank you very much. I'm happy to propose uh, as has been presented to us. Thank you, Councillor Mackay. Uh, do we have a seconder? Second, Chair. Councillor Cook, thank you very much. Is anyone otherwise minded? No? OK, thank you. We have a decision then. Thank you very much. Lynn, over to you. Thank you, Chair. The decision of the committee is that the application has been approved, subject to the conditions and for the reasons detailed on the in the report, and that the decision notice be withheld until the... Section 69 is amended to reflect the application number. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Lynn. Can I thank uh, panel members? That was our last item. So can I thank panel members for their uh, attendance today uh, and, and doing their work to reach decisions? And can I thank uh, officials for uh, helping us get there and uh, answering our questions? Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Chair. Take care. Bye. Bye.